bring us all the way into the full purpose because the purpose in his heart hasn't changed. How many of you have received words over 15 or 20 years ago that haven't happened yet? There's a lot of people in this room. Do you think they're still going to happen or do you think the time's passed? They're still going to happen. And we have a generation of people who are, are believing radical things. And there's a whole new generation rising. If you've been saved for less than five years, you're probably believing some pretty big things. But there's people in this room who've been believing those things for 30, 40, 50 years. And like my parents have been believing since, you know, 1972, before I was born. They were believing that radical things were going to happen. They have prophetic words that are still sitting on that haven't happened. And they're in there, you know, my dad's in the 70s. My mom, well, my mom's turning, just turned 70. And so there, there's people who are still believing things that haven't happened yet. And it's going to take a miracle for it to happen for a generation of people. Thank God we have a God who loves miracles. Bob Jones prophesied in 2011, and he said in 2012, what was supposed to come for some of you in 2008 will no longer be delayed. So a lot of us were believing that 2008 would be a breakthrough year. And Bob said what you've been believing would happen in 2008 or from 2008 on will start to happen in 2012. The resistance will be broken. I just thought I'd add that in just because of the Bob Jones word that was really fun. Now, Ezekiel 12, this is the word of the Lord for this year for some of you. It's not for all of you, but for some of you. And you'll know who you are because it's hysterical. Because you'll know, yeah, that's what I need to hear. Ezekiel 12, verse 22, Son of man, what is in the proverb that you have in this land of Israel? The days go by when every vision comes to nothing. Say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I am going to put an end to this proverb and they will no longer quote it. Say to them, the days are near when every vision will be fulfilled. Now, the number 12 is a governmental year. We're about to have a shift in the government of the church. There's been church, more churches in the last 10 years have failed in America than since we started. I mean, we've had, we've had a failure period of 10 years. More churches have failed in 10 years than hundreds of years all put together. Isn't that crazy? God obviously wants something. I've been a part of some of the failed churches. They're hard. When the church fails, it is, I mean, some of you have been a part of it too. It's, and when a church has a purpose and then man got in the way, it's devastating to communities of people. It's so hard. And some of you are still living with some of those wounds. And it's, it's a really good time to get healed and mature past those wounds. It's a really good time to let them go. It's a really good time to let go of when you were controlled or manipulated or Jezebel or any of those things. It's a really good time to just make a higher choice and go, you know what, I'm not going to live with that anymore. It doesn't matter. It's a really good time to clean the slate, get the counseling, get the, you know, get the inner healing, whatever you need. Because God, right now, is ready to mature you and bring you into a place that you can actually start to live out those dreams, live out those desires. And he's shaking everything. We've watched it for 10 years. Everything that can be shaken right now, uh, I think in America, the church is on a decline. The Christianity has been on a decline of 3 to 6% a year, depending on the year in the last five years. 50% of the church, according to Barnard Group, is not going to Sunday mornings. Or 50% of Christians, sorry, are not going to Sunday mornings. That means that half of the church is outside of the church. Half of the church is outside of a Sunday morning experience or community experience. And the Bible does say, don't, you know, don't forsake meeting with each other because things happen then. You know, and Paul was really clear. Like, don't forsake meeting with the brethren because you need the encouragement. And so, I mean, like, some people get it, though. It's a, we're in new societies, so some people get it through the Internet. Some people get it through radio and TV. I get that. So there's seasons where, um, you know, I, I remember I was in my pickle church, and I fasted at church for a year. So I need to not come for a year because I've been so burned out. I've been coming, and I still do ministry. And so I'm gonna, I won't leave the fellowship of believers. I'm still going to tie to you, but I'm just, I need a little bit of a break from meetings. I'm meeting down. He said, cool, do it. You know, but I, it, it wasn't leaving God or leaving institution. It was just like taking a break. So I understand that some people do that from time to time. But that shouldn't be our way of life. You know, that shouldn't be, like, our excuse of, like, I'm just, usually when you're like, oh, I don't want to go, it's because something inside of you has been hurt or turned off. And so God wants to heal that really quickly. Now, I'm going to go to the, the positive part. That's, that's the negative part. Get to it. Oops. I have so many notes on this message that run backwards. Oops, here we go. So, Matthew 11, I believe that this is for those who are maturing in this season, in the body of Christ, who've gone through a lot. Matthew 11, 27, this is the message version. Jesus resumed talking to the people, but now tenderly. The Father has given me all these things to do and say, this is a unique father-son operation coming out of the father and son intimacies and knowledge. 
No one knows the Son the way the Father does, nor the Father the way the Son does. But I'm not going to keep it to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to be willing to listen. And in this season, like we're trying to figure out like how do we connect to you, God? This is the promise of Jesus Himself over us. I'm willing to give it to anybody who will listen. Line by line, He'll teach you right now to mature. Right, line by line, He'll mature you. James 1 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials and tribulations of any kind, because this must develop this work, work of perseverance in you and endurance in you, which develops, you know, character, and when you live in the land, which develops hope. When you live in the land of hope, you're never disappointed. And so we're in a season where the body of Christ is learning how to persevere and have character so that we can live in hope. How many of you are so glad that the, the people you're serving with in ministry have character, Right? Like, I love my team at Back in Expression 58 because there's character in my team. They don't manipulate. They don't try and get their way over each other. I mean, when they manifest jealousy, they deal with it. They self-manage and self-diagnose. So much stuff. There's so much character. And the most of them are young, but I'm telling you, I'm so proud of them for what they're walking through. If they start to struggle with something, they, they get right into a process and they're vulnerable. They have no problem telling you what they're struggling with. There's no hiding. We don't, we don't hide because... You'll get this, we don't have a church jail, so no one's worried about going to jail. So they don't hide anything. You know, there's no like little room in the back that you have to sit in if you do something wrong for a while. There's no timeout. You know, they manage their own timeouts. So I don't time them out. We, you know, we 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 relate to each other in a place of trust. So when they violate trust, they diagnose and say, "I've broken trust with you. I want to restore." You know, it's like totally different. And I believe that you know this this whole thing as far as you know character developing. A work of hope, like our, our, our church hasn't developed a land of hope where people aren't disappointed. Our churches have developed a land that everyone's disappointed all the time in business and divorce and suicide rates and drug addiction rates. But what God's doing is that he's shaking the church at large so that it can be an organization that manifests, reflects the character of Jesus. So that people can feel hope and safety because they can feel the substance of the nature of God which feels like good character. You can do a fruit check with Jesus, and he always measured up. You do a fruit check with you when you're driving in traffic, do you, does it measure up? You know, it's like when it says in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, love does not boast. When you put your name in there, because it says God's love, he can put his name in there, he's worthy of it. But when you put your name in there, Sean is patient, Sean is kind. Sean does not, you know, Sean holds no records of the wrong ever, right, Shri? Never. Never. You know, like... <laughs> So it's like, you know, like we don't necessarily fully measure up to the standard of love that we're supposed to be emulating because people will know us by our love, which means that we have the character behind the love, which means when people look at our character, they feel safe and the boundaries of that character because our character protects love. Why does divorce happen? Because somebody stops protecting love. You know, my dad, uh, who's been married to my mom for 51 years, if he looked at my mom and then, you know, saw somebody who's walking by who's interested in some woman who, you know, like some bluesy, I'm just kidding, who uh, walked by and he, and he became interested in her and, and, and he's entertained that, then he wouldn't be protecting the love that he's developed for 51 years in his marriage. And he loves my mom so much that he doesn't even, she doesn't even feel like he'll entertain that thought. He doesn't feel like he'll entertain that thought. He could be surprised maybe, but he's never been surprised. He's like, why would I even look at something else when I have such a great family and I have such a great wife? I'm going to protect this. Holiness is not sinlessness. Holiness is saying there's something to protect. I'm going to do my best to not sin so that I can keep this solid. So when you understand that, and you understand that God's investing in the church a true spirit of holiness, which is a, a spirit to protect love at all costs, then it's not about right and wrong. And it's not about getting disqualified. It's not about... You know, if you sin, you're going to hell. If you sin, you know, you're going to lose it. If you sin, it's about if you sin, you're going to lose the heart of the people. If you sin, you're going to lose the heart of your wife. If you sin, you're going to lose the heart of your children. And it's hard to get it back. Is it worth it to you for that one minute? Is it worth it to you for that ten minutes? So when love is the center of the church, when there's a love revolution in the middle of it, people stop doing stupid things. When there's a value on love, people stop doing extreme things. And I believe that there's an issue that God's restoring that this great harvest that we're believing for of souls is going to, the central, the central, you know, point, the central value, the core spirit of it is going to be true love. So that, therefore, it's not going to be about revival activity, like healing and prophecy. All those things can be a part of it. You know, evangelism, all those things can be a part of it. But you know what's really going to be? 
People who are in life breakdown going, who has answers? And someone else will say, I heard the Christians at that church don't have any divorce right now. Like that everyone's getting healed up. They're all in marriage encounters and they have things that are happening like the counseling. And if you go there, you, you know, like you're devastated. I don't have answers for you. But if you go there, I think you can ask the Christians. You know, people are going to say, how do we raise our kids? We have no life skills. We don't know what kind of discipline to give them. We don't know what. And they're going to say, someone around them is going to say, you know what? My neighbors have the best kids I've ever seen. They're Christians. They go to this church. You should go check them out. There's going to be a revival. Of course, there will be supernatural prophetic encounters and blah, 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 and angels, whatever. But you know what one of the most supernatural encounters is right now? It's your love. When somebody sees love that speaks more than any word ever could because they look and they witness something that feels protective, that feels solid. And it's so missing from the world that that healthy marriage right now is a miracle. It's so missing from the world that teenagers that love their parents and have a real relationship with good boundaries with their parents, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. So, I mean, my parents have, the number one thing people ask them about, they've moved in healing, they've seen cancer healed, they've seen backs who have, you know, would never recover healed. My mom's seen SRA people healed and completely delivered, restored 100%, not 20%. She's seen multiple personalities merge all into one, you know, person um, over and over and over and over, probably about 25 times, which if anybody who works with that area, she doesn't work with it anymore, would understand that that's a big deal. That's a radical miracle. So people would come to them, you know, for all kinds of reasons, for just their, just, just to know them. But the number one question that they had from everybody who was, like, not super, like, in the revival crowd, the number one question they had is, how did you succeed in family and in marriage? That was the number one question. You know what the world's concerned about right now? How do I grow in love? And God's raising up mature lovers. This harvest of harvesters isn't like just anointing people to be the Josephs under Pharaoh so that we can have millions of dollars going to the kingdom. We can have these incredible buildings. We've done that. We've been there and we've done that. We have incredible buildings. Crystal Cathedral right now is up for auction. The Catholic Church is buying it. Incredible building. Incredible building that many of you put money into in the 80s. I mean, everybody was on this, you know, do you remember that? Does anybody remember that? Like when they were doing all the telephones and stuff? And now it's like bankrupt. And the Schulers are a great family. They're great people, but it's bankrupt. They're moving out down the street into a different place. There's beautiful buildings that had a purpose. But you know what? That Joseph thing of just like, let's be rulers in the land and have incredible resources isn't enough. Let's have bigger churches and do the seeker-friendly thing and have... 5,000 member churches, and I love big churches. I actually like bigger churches because I love worshiping with 5,000 people at a time. So I love that. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely like, I've been a part of big churches my whole life. But just having a big church isn't enough. And I, I went to a friend of mine who, um, he pastors at uh, what used to be a secret friendly church in, uh, in uh, Colorado, in, in Rock City, Colorado. And, and it's a huge church, and he started inviting like Bill Johnson, Randy Clark, myself, other people in, and he's like, I don't know if this is going to destroy us or build us. But we weren't coming in to bring another healing anointing or to bring another prophetic anointing. We were coming in to bring love that had a reflection in it of healing, that had a reflection of the prophetic. So actually, it grew his church even more. Actually, it helped him. A few people left because they were like, we don't believe in this. We're cessationists. But actually, because they kept the core of love, it worked. But we don't need just more megachurches because megachurches become social clubs if they're not about the Father's business, not about love. They become just glorified YMCA's where they meet all the community needs, which is awesome. And we want to do that too, but that can't be our only thing we're going after because otherwise we might as well just empower worldly organizations who do it better because they have more resources and they have more connections to the government and everything around them. And so we want to do, if we have a big church that meets the community needs, it better be meeting God's needs first which is to be adored and loved. And so I feel like there's been a shaking where we've watched many of these churches fail, and it's so sad, but it also leaves a gap and a room and a space for something new to emerge in mass. I mean, uh, I can't remember how many churches. I was reading in the Barna report from last year, and, and I think it was like 7,000 churches in North America shut down in one year, one of the most ever in history. And I looked at that, that, I'm such a positivity guy, though, but I looked at it and I was like, that is so sad. And I was like, but that means that God's about to raise something up that the world's never seen. Because all those people are going somewhere. All those people want to do something. All those people want to still impact the Lord. If they started a church, 
They have a passion inside of them that wanted to see the kingdom born, and that one didn't work, but what will work? I mean, they're not just going to go away and go, oh, they're just another Christian anymore. They're going to go away and say, what will work? And when God matures us and he gives us a, a release of what really is going to work, we run out of ourselves and we, and we get shaken. Usually in that period, like I've, I've met pastors who the churches have failed. As a matter of fact, we have several friends in L.A. that they planted churches and their churches failed in L.A. It just didn't work for them financially or otherwise. And it wasn't because they weren't had moral failures or anything like that. It just didn't work. And so, I, you know, a few of them are just hanging out, just going, we're not sure what to do, but we're still in the city, and we're still going to serve God here, and we're still going to do ministry. I'm like, yes, because God shook them, and something was shaken out, and now they're like, now I really have to be strategic. I need to hear from God. One of the guys asked him, how can we plant a church in L.A.? They said, I heard it was one of the most unchurched places, and I wanted to come here. I said, so God didn't call you to it. He goes, no. I said, that's really hard. He goes, but you know what? When my church failed, now I'm called to it. Now I heard, then I sought God until I heard his voice and I heard his heart over the people. I fell in love with the people of L.A. And I went, this isn't a good idea anymore. This is a God assignment. From a totally conservative church. You know, the Anglican vicar in our, in our city of, of Hollywood, he is radically, radically charismatic. And he is trying to figure out right now, he wants to hear God as clearly as possible. Because he's like, God, you want to restore what this Anglican church did in the, in the early 1900s. You want to restore that now. And the only way we can do that and have the influence of Hollywood that you're calling us to is by having a sovereign encounter here. And he's like, pastoring, he's a white-haired guy, but he's pastoring all white-haired people. And he's like, well, how are we going to do this? But, you know, he, he marches around Hollywood with his prayer things, like stealth prayer things with his wife. They do, like, crazy intercession exploits. They hear from God powerfully. And I'm like, I love that you're positioned here because at the proper time, when there is a full tipping point, when revival breaks out, you will be in the center. Because you're practicing everything that's in God's heart now before he's even displaying it or manifesting it in mass. Okay. I wasn't going to go this long on those points, but I don't always admit, so it's good. This is what a tipping point looks like. Ezekiel 46, and if you can turn here, verse 16. Uh, through about 20, but this is what the Sovereign Lord says. If the prince makes a gift from his inheritance to one of his sons, it will belong to his descendants and it will be their property by inheritance. If, however, he makes a gift from his inheritance to one of his servants, the servant may keep it until the year of freedom, then it will revert to the prince. His inheritance belongs to his sons only, it is theirs. The prince must not take any of its inheritance to his people from the, uh, or the inheritance of the people, driving them off their property. He is to give his sons their inheritance out of his own property so that none of my people will be separated from his property. Now here's a picture in that. If a prince gives an inheritance to a servant, it's only theirs until the day of freedom. There's many things that the father wanted for Jesus and our generation. And there's lots of things that serve them. And I mean, there's a whole entertainment industry that's going on right now that you and I didn't find here. There's very few Christian pioneers in it, but man, the screen is one of the most beautiful places to see Jesus, isn't it? Isn't it awesome to hear reports through television and media? Or you think of like, you know, business. It's like, it's not, we weren't the, the engineers of the, the best modern, excuse me, modern principles of business. We have some good ones, but man, there's something that, that served God in America, the business industries, where there's some principles. Like you can read leadership books and uh, uh, business leadership books that are by unsafe people, and truth is truth, man. There's some incredible truth out there that you can read, that you can saturate it in, just like you can, you know, when you read the Bible and it goes into you because it's the spirit of truth, there's leadership books that will complement the Bible that are out there that weren't written by Christians. And it's amazing that there's so much truth out there because there's things that are serving God, but in a day of freedom, like, and this is a Daniel day and a Joseph day when you watch Daniel, and a day of freedom where God's about to free his people he raises people up and he displaces people who are in an office and he puts his people in that office because the inheritance is for his sons and for his sons alone. So in a day of freedom, all kinds of people get shaken out of office. All kinds of systems get broken and all kinds of God sons rise up and start to manifest in those, in those areas. And it's not like King of the Mountain where we're taking everything over. That, that we can't be like the manifested sons of God where we rule and reign everything. It's just not, it's not going to happen until then age to come fully, but there has to be places of agreement where the kingdom works in fullness. 
where the kingdom has a full display of power with and without believers, where because there's Joseph's in place, Pharaohs are blessed whether they choose God or not. And there's a day of freedom coming, and it's been prophesied since 1907 on Azusa Street. In every major move of God, people prophesied about the jubilee year, the day of freedom, when God would release the inheritance back to the sons. He would take it from those things that served him, and he would raise up a people in a day, in a moment, in an hour, to fill those positions that were pioneered by these servants who were serving him and were blessed by the service of it, but they were no longer going to be there. And, and as a matter of fact, I remember when Paul King told me in the 90s, he said that there was going to be many people who, in the entertainment industry who were going to die all at once. Like it would be like, and, again, and it wasn't a negative, like he wasn't like prophesying death or declaring death. But he was saying, I'm just seeing that there's going to be a season of time, and it would be like for over three or four years, where like he goes like six newscasters will die in a row. And we've been in that. We've just had seven newscasters in the last five years die in a row who were our news leaders of the, of the world. I think there's like one left. That were like the, the old guys, the old regime. He said, and when that would happen, it would be a sign of the changing of the guard. He said, at the same time, in the church, many of the generals would go home during that, certain, that same period of time because there's a changing of the guard that's happening. We're watching that. There's a changing of the guard. There's a tipping point coming. The world is changing. The landscape is changing. And it's for your good because you're a son. You're a daughter. And in the day of freedom, when God blows the holy trumpet, whatever it looks like, when he goes, hey, it's time, you start to get positioned to rule and reign and inherit with him because he wants to inherit a full kingdom. So a tipping point isn't just like, oh, my life gets better. Oh, I get the new thing I needed. Dave, my family's back. Now, here's the last part of this whole encounter. One um, little prophetic word for you, which is out of an encounter. When we moved to Los Angeles, I was... Uh, in my room one night, and uh, we had the church in the house, and it's a really cool story how we had this house in Hollywood Hills for about a year and a half, and that's where we met. It was very organic, very sovereign. It was the very first house that a producer named um, Dr. Bennett lived in who produced a lot of the first films in Hollywood, and he moved the community in the Hollywood Hills, and there were think tanks on the house, that birthed the whole entertainment industry for film television. And I lived in the historic Bennett house um, and birthed my church out there. And there, it was about a 7,500 square foot house, we sovereignly got it. An actor owned it, and um, I, I had a negotiation time with him where I told him what we are going to be doing for the kingdom. He let us rent it for a super discounted rate for about a year and four or five months. I can't remember if it was a year and four months or five months. And so one of the nights we were there, we would do Tuesday night services there. And um, it's a place where you don't normally do services. It's like all these like, little mini mansions and stuff that are older. And, um, but we did services, and all our neighbors loved us and hated us for it. And, but there's parties like on every street every night, so it wasn't like we were doing anything that unusual. And so we we would do these services, and like 100 people would show up. And we were, they were not advertised. It was invitation only, not because we were elitist, but we, we didn't want to grow anything. We were just trying to grow our team and heal our team up because we had just moved from Alabama. And we inherited from five broken churches people all at once. And so we had a lot of brokenness. And I'll, I'll tell you this part, just so you know, it was, it was gloomy. Like we had one of the churches we inherited, even some of the pastors from that church, the lead pastor was a homosexual and slept with all of his staff members, the men, regularly in orgies. Christian church, it was anointed by one of the major denominations and it got exposed right a couple years before we moved there. One of the churches was teaching polygamy. This is like a you know, mainstream Christian denomination. Started teaching polygamy and started taking on wives. And it happened in just a secret way for three months. And it was only three months, but that was dramatic because people's wives were stolen things happened. So we had a bunch of young people come from that church. One of the churches, they started teaching on, um, you know, the pastor was supposed to have um, sexual relations. It was almost all sexual sin. And there was like five in a row. And then one of the pastors just stood up in his church and said, one of the best churches I've ever been to, stood up in his church. He went crazy from chemotherapy and told everybody that the Holy Spirit was leaving the church. And if they wanted to walk with God, they had to leave with him and walk out the door or else they'd be cursed. I mean, this is like a normal church. And he just went crazy and... He's passed away now, and he just, you know, he went out and just destroyed this Hollywood church that had so many celebrities, and Craig T. Nelson went there, and, and um, Diane Cannon, and like, just so many celebrities went to this church, and just, just funky stuff happened right before, a couple years before we got there. So we started these meetings, and we inherited funky people, but awesome people, and they all came super broken, mostly under 28, 20, 29, and so, but they all went to these churches, a lot of them were serving these churches, some were like pastoral leaders in these churches. And we're like, 
okay, so we've inherited a broken but awesome people. And it wasn't like broken like they were living homelessly or anything. It was just broken like they'd been through a lot. And they shouldn't have ever gone through what they'd gone through. They were scarred because of it. So we started praying into their lives and their healing. They were awesome. Like they were totally pursuing God. They'd had dreams and visions, but they'd been sidetracked or they'd been whatever. So in that season, that was our first year. Now our church has radically changed since that initial group birthed it. But I mean, like we've had so many different types of streams now come. That's completely different. But that first year was kind of a restoration year for a lot of people in Los Angeles. And, and so I, I was up in my room and I was feeling sick that night. So I couldn't go to the service that we were having downstairs. And I, we had our internship was coming in. Uh, that was our first night. We do an internship uh, pretty regularly. And, um, and I had met the intern yet because I've been sick for two days. I hate being sick. Don't you hate being sick? Yeah. So I was like, this is ridiculous. I'm up in my room. They're worshiping downstairs. I'm like, I just want to be downstairs. I'm watching with the news or something on my TV. I'm like, this, this is so stupid I, that I have a fever right now. This is like the dumbest thing ever. Like, i just been icing healing all weekend long. And I got home and I had a fever. I was like, this is so stupid. You know, like, I, I'm being taken out by a cold. Awesome, you know. And uh, so I'm, I'm throwing a fit. And... And they start worshiping, and all of a sudden they start singing that John Mark McGillan song. This is back when no one was singing the song, but he loves us, oh, how he loves us. But it was in a voice, the guy who was leading, I'd never heard him before. I was like, who is that down there? That's not my worship guy. That's awesome. Like, who, this is amazing. Like, someone must be visiting and singing the song. And, and all of a sudden, I'm singing it with them, because I didn't know anybody knew this song. You know, like, I'm singing it, I've, I'd been out with John Mark before he recorded the song, and so I've been... You know, I was used to that song, and I was like, this is one of my favorite songs, he loves us, and I'm singing it, and all of a sudden there's a man standing next to me, and I'm like, a crazy man just came into my room, like, this because you never know, it's Los Angeles, I was like, some guy standing next to me, and I looked, but he looked kind of biblical. And I went, oh my gosh, and I literally pulled my covers over my head, and I only saw him for a second, I was like, I think that song from the Bible, I, you know, like, I felt crazy. And I hear the Holy Spirit say, welcome to deliver. And I knew that it was another form of Jesus. Wow. Welcome to deliver. And I started getting so excited, you guys. I was like, the deliverer has come to Los Angeles. There's a, he's going to deliver us from, I mean, I'm praying for the people by name that I know are downstairs who need a radical breakthrough, who've been destroyed by leaders in the body of Christ who just sent. I mean, people who've been destroyed by addictions, people who's marriages have been obliterated. I, mean, I knew a lot of their weakness because they're very vulnerable in Hollywood. You, you wear your stuff on a sleeve. It's not like you ever hide anything. So I'm like, I'm like praying for them going, oh God, because at this point I couldn't see them anymore. So I'm like going, I don't know what to do, so I'm just going to pray for their deliverance. And I'm like, you know, oh, and I was so energized. It wasn't like, it wasn't bad that I was doing this, but it wasn't what he came for. And so after like 15 minutes and they're still singing, he loves us, and they're in an experience downstairs, I realize I'm healed completely healed, and I'm like, I jump up, and I put on clothes, and I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm healed, and the Holy Spirit said, you're missing it, he didn't come just to deliver you from something, he's come to deliver you into a land that it was promised, and I, and I heard the Holy Spirit say that everything that you need just to get delivered from has already been provided, it's time to go into, and I'm like, oh my gosh, we need so much, are you serious that you're going to just deliver us? Because the spirit of overcomer isn't about overcoming the world. It's about overcoming the kingdom. It's about becoming something. So I went downstairs, and I, and the, they were shocked. That my team was shocked to see me because, I mean, I was alive, and they knew I was sick. A couple of them had come upstairs early before and saw how sick I was. And I came downstairs, and I got on the mic, and I'm like, ah, it's delivered. Ah. You know, just I sounded terrible because I was just so gripped with the experience, and I loved them all so much. And, and I was just so excited that, they were going to have a breakthrough and be delivered from stuff so they could become who they were supposed to be. And it was so alive in me, and, so, and it's still so real in me tonight for you. It's still so real, but, but I'm, I'm, I couldn't even share it well, but they got the whole spirit of it. Like, it was just transferred, like, mind to mind, heart to heart, without me sharing it really well. And they were, like, going, oh, my gosh, I, all of us got kind of delivered. Like, I got to get over thinking about what I need to get delivered from. And I need to start thinking about the promised land. I need to start thinking about the reality of what I'm going to walk in. Because all of this is going to fade. All the suffering is going to go away. My heart is going to be fully healed. So I need to get out of that mode of like, it's so selfish sometimes to all the things we have to focus on to just get over something. All our physical problems, all our emotional stuff, and all of our baggage. It's like, I mean, everybody's just had this like, not that that's wrong to want to be delivered. It's beautiful to want to be delivered. But it was like, the focus changed. 
off of self and getting just over something. I mean, how many times we go to prayer and we're like, we do this, God, we do this, God, we do this, God. And he's like, I just want you to, like, know me and focus on me in a way that's way beyond what I can do for you. Just to help you with something. And I was like, oh my gosh. You want to deliver us. And so the, our team got it. Like, our crew got it. Our, the people got it. There were some visitors there that are still with us today because of that encounter. Something happened to people where they just, they went into high gear. There's a guy who had struggled with homosexuality his whole life. Never understood why it was wrong, but always knew that the church said it was wrong. It was like kind of in that debating, like, I think it's okay, kind of, you know. And Jesus showed up his wife in that moment. So the argument had to go away. And he started to see his promise line was to walk with a woman and have children. Kind of kills the argument of if it's right or wrong. You know, it's like, he's no longer struggling with, like, am I homosexual? He saw his wife. You know what I mean? Like, he's married now. I just think, like, you know, like, like Jesus came and delivered people. It was no longer about right and wrong and theology and all that kind of stuff. They just, like, entered into a moment of seeing what they needed to look at. And they started looking at Jesus and looking at the promises so much that they forgot everything else. Other than to say, i got to get out of this season I've been in. I need to come into this season. And the Lord showed me, he said, this is the season that the whole church is about to go through. And then this year, when I woke up to this year, like when I woke up on January 1st, I knew that this is the year that Jesus steps in as a deliverer. But it wasn't to birth deliverance ministry. It was to birth people into promises. Amen. So I want us all to stand. Do you guys realize how awesome you are? Like, do you realize how much he loves you? Like, like I know you're hungry because you come on a Sunday night. Like, church is not... You know, at large, this is not a, a picking on River Rock or my church expression 58 or any other church represented here. Church is not as exciting as it should be, period. And it's not my fault. It's not Wendy's fault. You know, it's not, it's not, it's, you know, if you're bored, it's because you're boring. It's not like my fault that you're, you know, boring. It's like, you know, I'm not bored in my faith. Wendy's not bored in her faith. But there's a lot of bored people. And it's like, you, you have to understand that, that, that God's about to revolutionize everything, but it's not just to, I mean, I love inner healing ministries. I love counseling. We have, I mean, 27 people on our counseling life coaching list right now that we refer people to. We love it. We are constantly outsourcing to our counselors because it's so